Good morning, everybody. Today I'm at Wellfield Botanic Gardens, which is downtown Elkhart, actually. And I filmed from here before. Um, I don't think I've ever filmed from this exact location. I'm in a covered area here. It's kind of a gazebo because we have rain in the forecast. And it should be coming any time, actually, maybe before I'm done filming this. We're in Revelation chapter 13, uh, <laughs> which is a chapter that I've been kind of anticipating here in the book of Revelation. It's a highly symbolic chapter, as the rest of the book is. But let's get right into it here. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. John speaking here. He says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now he's still in the Spirit, seeing these things. So I imagine that an angel or the Lord or, or somebody is taking him to these different places where he can see these things in the Spirit. But he says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay. <laughs> This has been interpreted as many different things down through the years. Uh, centuries ago, it was uh, assumed that this was the Roman Empire. There's a lot of different things that have been attributed to this beast. Some people believe that it's a man. Other people believe that it's a world system. But the word heads there, where it says having seven heads, that is the word kafali in the Greek. The word heads. And what that means is supreme, chief, or the, the prominent part. So when it says it had seven heads, it's saying that it has seven chief or prominent parts to it. Okay? And so it's not necessarily heads, like a seven-headed creature, even though that's the way he's seeing it in the spirit. Because this is obviously the entity that is behind this thing that's being described. Okay? The horns has seven heads and ten horns. Well, it makes you wonder, how's that divided, you know? So there's only seven heads and ten horns, so obviously one or more of the heads has more than one horn. It doesn't tell us. The word horns there is the Greek word karas. And what that means is it's that it's a symbol of strength and courage. And it's like that all through the scriptures. There's a Hebrew word, and I didn't look it up, but there's a Hebrew word that's translated horn also. And you see that through the Old Testament. You see it a lot in the Psalms where David would say uh, that the Lord exalts my horn and things like that. What that means is your, your courage or your bravery, or it's a symbol of, of your strength, the horn is. Okay? So it had... Ten horns, ten facets of strength, maybe. Then it says, upon these horns, upon the ten horns, are ten crowns. So could the horns be men? Possibly. That's possible. In the book of Daniel, there's uh, a part where it talks about the horns that came up on, on a particular beast that Daniel's seeing, and it says, a little horn came up and exalted itself above the others. So these horns could actually be uh, courageous or strong 
liters, maybe. All right? And then there's a crown on each one of the horns, so that means that's a symbol of royalty, the crown. So that would mean that each one of these horns is royal, in a way. So, what I would take this to mean here is that there's this beast, that there's seven different parts to it. It's the meaning of the heads. Seven, seven different facets to this beast. There's ten strong leaders, maybe, in these seven parts. Are they countries? Maybe. And there's crowns on each one of these horns. So that leads me to kind of believe that the, these ten are maybe leaders, kings, or presidents, or something like that, okay? Verse 2, and the beast which I saw, all right, he describes it a little bit more here. He says it was like unto a leopard. It had spots, maybe, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. Okay, so it had different feet. It wasn't regular leopard feet. It had the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, now we know the dragon is the devil, or Satan. And the dragon gave him his power. It says him here. And his seat. And great authority. All right. Now, there's several things I want to examine here. The animals. Uh, I didn't uh, reference the passages in Daniel that line up with this, because there are some. In Daniel chapter 7, um, I'm not going to quote them directly here, <laughs> because... It would make this video much longer than what it needs to be. We're studying the book of Revelation here. But in the book of Daniel, he sees some beasts come up out of the sea also in a vision that he had. And he sees uh, a lion come out of the sea that has eagle's wings. And then he says the wings are plucked off and made to stand on their feet like a man. Uh, many people believe that to be the United States coming out of which is a symbol of the eagle coming out of Great Britain which is Great Britain is as a symbol of a lion it always has now in times past this was thought to be Babylon um, which Babylon I guess had the symbol of a lion uh, <laughs> so like I said, there's been different interpretations down over the ages. Uh, the bear, currently, that's assumed to be Russia. The Russian bear is always symbolized by the bear. Uh, then he sees a creature that looks like a leopard with four heads. I'm talking about the book of Daniel here. Okay, not, not the scripture that we're in. And the leopard that Daniel sees has four heads. And this is generally now believed to be Germany. Uh, there were three Reichs for sure, and they believe that there's a fourth Reich right now that's going on, which is part of the world system. All right? So that's interesting that John here brings up the same type of animals that are mentioned in the vision that Daniel was shown. All right? Now, there, Daniel, I'm not sure whether it was a vision or, or whether the angel was actually showing him these things. I'd have to go back and read it and see. But there is now, outside of the United Nations building, in New York City, and it is an image of what is described here. Now, why would they put that there? <laughs> and, and I'll show it. When I make the video here, I'll, I'll show it in the video. 
But this beast that they put outside the UN looks like what's described here. It looks like a, a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. Okay? It seems kind of odd that they would put that right outside the United Nations. Unless the United Nations, this world system, is claiming to be this beast of Revelation. Which is actually highly likely that this beast here that's talked about has something to do with the the world system. Okay? Notice that it says there in verse 2 that the dragon gave him his power. Now it calls it him, but I don't believe this beast is one particular person. There may be one particular person put in the head spot of it, but this beast in general, I believe, is the world system. And I'll explain why here in a little bit. But it says, the dragon gives him his power and his authority. So this conglomerate beast, whatever it is, gets its power and its authority from Satan. So this beast here, his god is the dragon. His leader is the dragon. He gets his authority and his power and his seat from the devil. Okay? So this this uh, conglomerate beast is controlled by Satan. And it even resembles the dragon. Because in the last chapter, if you'll remember, in chapter 12, verse 3... It said, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And now it specifically tells you in that chapter, in the last chapter, that this great red beast is the dragon. But now notice that the dragon mentioned in chapter 12 only has seven crowns upon the heads. So it's a little bit different than the beast. The beast has ten crowns upon its ten horns and seven heads. But the dragon has seven heads and ten horns, but only seven crowns on the heads instead of ten crowns on the ten horns. That's the difference. And this is red. It's a red dragon. It specifically says that. Now, the beast is this conglomerate beast, which looks like a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. All right. Now, let's move on here. In verse 3, he says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now, remember, the heads are chief or prominent parts of this beast. That's what the head symbolizes. The word kafali in the Greek means supreme, chief, or prominent. Could it be people? Yeah, it could be. But notice that the crowns are on the horns. So I tend to think more and more than likely the horns are people and the crowns are, means that each one of these are rulers, are royalty. But this system, whatever it is, is divided into seven prominent parts, and that is the heads, I do believe. I think that's what it shows here in the text. One of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. Now, in the past, a lot of people, a lot of prophecy teachers have pictured this as being this, this beast with these seven heads, and one of the heads looks like it's dead or wounded. And it's been portrayed in many things, in movies and in books. And I'm not sure what it said in the Left Behind series. I never read that. <laughs> My mom did, but I never read that. Um, but I believe that's portrayed as being a man 
And it is in the movies. It's portrayed as being a man that is, say, shot in the head or something like that. He has a deadly wound. And then it goes on to say, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. All right. Here's why I don't believe that that the head is a person. Because I don't think it's a literal head wound because no one has seven heads. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It says this beast had seven heads. But then ten horns and ten crowns upon the horns. And I believe the horns are the, are the, uh, the strong leaders that each have a royal crown. That's what it seems to portray to me. And I think the beast itself is a world system. Which we see this happening in the world today, don't we? We certainly do. And they're coming right out now and calling it the New World Order. When in times past, say 20 years ago, they were saying, oh, that's a conspiracy theory, the New World Order. Well, now we see it was not a conspiracy theory. They were lying then because now they're coming right out and admitting it. They're calling it the New World Order. All right. So I believe this conglomerate beast here is the world system. And there's seven sections to it. So when it talks about one of the heads being wounded, I believe is... Now, this is just my belief. And we have to keep that in mind. We don't want to say in these scriptures, we don't want to ascribe a particular meaning to it and and then dig in, you know, and hang on to that and proclaim it as truth. Because the fact is, we really don't know. We really don't know. There could be multiple interpretations. All right? But I don't believe this is a literal head wound. I think it's one one facet of this beast is destroyed where it seems like it's it's done. But then it will miraculously come back. Now, one thing that crossed my mind in studying this is that there are seven continents. So maybe this is a, a world system and the seven heads are the seven continents. Because this is supposed to be a system that envelops the entire world. And we'll see that in a little bit. Now there's supposedly seven continents. There's there's Asia and Europe and Africa and Australia, North America, South America, and Antarctica if you want to include Antarctica as a continent. There's different ideas about that, I know, and it has to do with what your views are on uh, the biblical cosmology and the shape of the earth and all that, and all those kind of things, which I'm not going to get into here. But, the continents of the world are generally recognized as those seven. So could it be that The heads are just symbolic of all the world continents, maybe. It could be broken down smaller than that. Maybe countries or political regions. Now, of course, it may be something that's not in existence yet. We have to remember that, too. Uh, As Christians, a lot of us seem to, to get carried away sometimes and want to say, well, this is happening right now, and we're in the middle of this right now. Maybe. Maybe we are. But maybe we're not. This may be further in the future. There may be different elements of this that have not surfaced yet. And that's why it's difficult for us to understand it. I think as time goes along, things are going to uh, become more and more clear as to what these things mean. All right. Now, verse 4. 
and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Now, it says here, they. So, whenever we see something like that, we need to look back at the previous verse and take it all in this proper context to ascertain who they is. Well, in the previous verse, it said, all the world wondered after the beast. So, it's talking about the world here. It's talking about the citizens of, of the world. They worshipped the dragon the devil, which gave power unto the beast. Remember, we already talked about that. He's given his seat and his authority and his power from the devil. This beast, whether it's a system or a single man or whatever it is, I don't believe that it's one single man. I think it's a world system. But it says, and they worshipped the beast. All right, so they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, so they actually worship Satan. And they worship the beast also, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, I believe this is talking about this world, this one world order, this political system, this governmental system that rises up. Who is like it? What can we be better? Let's swear our allegiance to this system. That's what it sounds like. Verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth. All right. So we know there is people in this. There is a human element in it. There was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Now, if for people that believe this beast to be one man, I don't believe it is. Because it says one of his heads was wounded. This just doesn't make sense. There's the seven heads and the ten horns and the ten crowns. And the devil gives this beast power over all the earth. I think it's a world system. Of course, there may be one person who heads this up. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. There's that three and a half years again. 42 months is three and one half years. So this one speaking, that's speaking the blasphemies, was given the power to continue 42 months. So I would assume this means from the time that he gets his authority, or maybe that he comes to prominence, and that people see him and recognize him as this authority. Not sure. There's several different ways you could, you could look at that. Verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Currently, there is a man who's just recently come to prominence, to notoriety. Now, of course, if, if you don't watch any of the uh, alternative media, if you only watch the network fake news, you probably won't even know who this guy is. You've probably never heard of him. Uh, because the regular news networks that you see on TV, they aren't telling you the truth at all. They indeed are fake news. So, I mean, if we want the truth, we really need to move out of our bubble. And the internet is still free speech at this point. It's not controlled too much. Uh, so, 
it is still possible to find out what's really going on with different situations. Of course, you don't want to just believe the first person you hear, but when you get 10 different outlets, 10 different people who really aren't associated with each other all saying the same thing, and there's proof of it, we can pretty much believe that this is what it is. Now, recently, the World Economic Forum has been in the forefront of the news. I want to be careful what I say here. I don't want to get any any strikes on, on my channel here or anything. But there is a man. First of all, there's the, the man who leads up the World Economic Forum, the WAF, is named Klaus Schwab. <laughs> uh, I'm going to withhold my opinion on this man. Uh, he's almost a caricature or a cartoonish type depiction of what you would envision of like a, a mad scientist or a uh, <laughs> some kind of crazy uh, Bond villain or something like that. He really is. If you've never heard him talk, you need to listen to him and see what he says. Uh, this man's chief advisor is a guy named Yuval Noah Harari. Now, if you haven't heard of this man, look him up too. Um, he is being called a prophet by many people. He is an atheist. He's a homosexual atheist. He's married to a man. Uh, he lives in Israel. He has a, uh, a degree from uh, some Hebrew universities there. He is a Jew, and so is his what he calls his husband is also a Jew and he is an atheist and what his studies are in are in merging humanity with machine and he comes right out and says that he blasphemes the name of Jesus he blasphemes God, he mocks anybody that believes in God or anything like that. Uh, he attacks all religions, especially Christianity. And he claims that we are gods and that we will become God through technology. That's what this man talks about. So he's the first person I thought of in reading this passage here. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. He just came to prominence just this year. A few months ago, I never heard of him before. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now... I'm not saying that this is speaking of this particular man, but the fulfillment of this will be somebody like that. Okay? Now, verse 7, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. He was given the power to overcome the saints. So once again here, we see that the saints of God, the Christians, the body of Christ, is there in the earth while these things are happening. They have not been disappeared out of the earth. That is not biblical. Remember that. But it says that it was given unto him. In other words, he's given the permission. And it, I guess that would only be from God that it would be given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, it's speaking of this mouth here. There's given unto him a mouth speaking great things. So here, it seems to be a person 
that comes out of this world system, which is the conglomerate beast. Okay? But it says he was it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Alright? The saints are the body of Christ. Whenever in the Bible it talks about saints in the New Testament, that's that's who it is. And power was given him. Now get this. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. All. All right. Now, if we look at our current world today, there is no system, world system, world government with that much power. Not now. Not that I know of. Even the the World Economic Forum, uh, they're more just the Western nations, the NATO countries. Russia has no part of that. And I don't believe China has any part of that. I don't think India has any part of that. Um, the United Nations? Maybe. Maybe. But every country is not a member country of the United Nations. Here it says that he is given power. So when it says that... It was given unto him to make war with the saints. It's not just talking about the mouth there. It's talking about the entire system. Because his mouth was was part of the beast. There was given unto him a mouth. A mouthpiece. Maybe the person who speaks for it. Maybe the leader. There's a lot of different ways to look at it here. But I don't think that there's any system right now that has power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In verse 8 it goes on, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now a lot of people take this, that statement right there, out of context. And they run with it and they say, okay, see... Everybody on earth will worship the beast. But that's not the end of the sentence. It says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That tells you right there that the Christians are here during this too. Everybody on earth that is not written in the book of life worships him. Those of us whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will not worship him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, I'm trying not to bring a whole lot of outside scripture into this because this is going to be a long video. I think, and that's why I didn't directly quote Daniel. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Thessalonica, he addresses an issue that they were dealing with. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. He's talking about concerning those things. Listen to me that I'm talking to you, is what he's saying, about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, which is the second coming when he returns and we're caught up with him in the air. All right? He says, That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as if from us. So obviously, there was somebody sending them letters there to the church of Thessalonica, pretending to be Paul. That, as that, the day of Christ is at hand. So somebody was sending them letters, pretending to be Paul, and stating, 
that the second coming had already happened. What people call the rapture. All right? He says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come. So obviously they were thinking, because of this charlatan that was telling them this, they were thinking that uh, it had already happened, that they and that they missed it somehow or something, or something. They were confused and they were upset about it. He says that they were shaken, but then he says, "Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. All right." falling away. There's different ideas on what the falling away is. Uh, I believe that we're seeing that. I believe that we have seen it over the last 20 years or so. The church grew and grew and grew through the ages. It never really diminished in any way. From the time of Jesus, it it kept growing. They kept adding to their numbers. You can read in the book of Acts how they were constantly adding to their numbers. And this happened all through history, all up through the Middle Ages and into our current time. Up until, oh, I'd say maybe uh, the late 90s, maybe the, the beginning of this current millennium, maybe. People started falling away from church. And a lot of people have rejected their faith. And many churches have had to shut down over this last 20 years or so. Their membership has fallen and gotten so bad that they've had to shut down. Now, yes, the church is not a building. But this is still falling away. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That's one thing that's going to happen first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, that matches this Harari guy that I was talking about to a T. He's saying all those things pretty much. Uh, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There's several different ideas about that. The Lord says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He tells the woman at the well, the time is coming when you won't worship God you know, in this mountain or in Jerusalem or anywhere else, but you'll worship him in spirit and in truth. So, this is an interesting thing here to consider. Maybe he's speaking about the temple of our bodies. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I think this is actually a holy place, a place set apart that he goes into and proclaims himself to be God. There's a lot of talk about the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Maybe that will come to pass. Maybe that will transpire. Some people believe that's literal. Some people believe that it's not literal and that there will never be another temple there in Jerusalem. Because now the temple is spiritual, in fact. The temple of God now is each one of us individually and together. That is the temple of God. So, will there be a third temple? Maybe. From what I understand, they have everything all together and they're all ready to do it. And there's a place there that they have planned out to build this temple right next to the Muslim Dome of the Rock, which is there in Jerusalem now. And from what I understand, they have all the implements for the temple and to resume 
sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. I'm not really sure whether all that will happen in that way. Maybe. But that's another subject. Now, this passage in Thessalonians. Okay. Now, <laughs> I brought that up because this has to do with this person that we're talking about who was given a mouth to speak these things. And Paul specifically tells those believers in Thessalonica back then, 2,000 years ago almost, he tells them that this won't happen until there's the falling away and the son of perdition is revealed. This one that speaks all these blasphemies. So this is what we want to watch for. And... And that guy that I'm talking about here, this Harari guy, a lot of these things are being said. I don't know. Keep an eye on him. And keep an eye on, on the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, uh, all these things, the Council of Foreign Relations, all these entities. And they all work together. Kind of like a conglomerate beast, you know? Now, back to Revelation, verse 9. <laughs> he says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. I love that. So we need to really listen to this. Listen. Uh, do some exegesis and, and pick the words apart. Exegesis is where you, <laughs> where you study the the scripture to the point where you look at the original language to what each of the words mean which is what I did a little bit with the, the, the heads and the and the horns and the crowns on the beast but when you search out the meanings of the original Greek words there you get a lot of different ideas about what these things could be alright if any man have an ear let him hear he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Captivity. So, there's different types of captivity. When we hear that word, we automatically think of, like, being imprisoned or you know, being sent off to a FEMA camp or captivity, you know, or somebody being on house arrest or in prison, something like that. But there's spiritual captivity, and there's mental captivity. There's many people that are bound in captivity in their own mind. And in their soul. Um, we can be captive to habits. We can be captive to different types of sin. So now, keeping that in mind, look at it again. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So, we want to make sure that we aren't leading people in a wrong way. That we aren't a negative influence on people that causes them to be led into some type of captivity. See what I'm saying? So this can be taken a lot of different ways. We need to make sure that we're walking correctly and doing the will of the Lord so that we don't cause others to stumble and cause them to become captive in some way in their body or their mind or in their soul in their spirit. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. We need to put our trust in God here. Now the sword, it's just talking about a, a weapon. 
Now, I never thought of it this way, that the sword, the Word of God is called the sword, the sword of the Spirit. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. That's another way of looking at it. So if you take the sword of the Word of God and you use it to persecute somebody, to beat somebody over the head with the Word of God, the same thing is going to happen to you. <laughs> it goes back to the judge not lest he be judged. Now, of course, of course, we don't want to take that out of context like the world does either. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. We need to abide. We need to help others to see what's going on around them. We need to help to bring others out of whatever type of captivity they're in. And into the freedom that is in Christ. Amen? Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. Okay. The horns like the lamb. Now, remember the horns symbolize power. They symbolize power or courage or, or something like that. So he has two horns, but the horns are like a lamb. Now the lamb is, is something that's equated with, with Christianity. So I'm thinking that this person or system, or whatever this is that he's seeing, is something that is masquerading as something that it's not. But then it says, and he spake as a dragon. So, if we listen to the speech that's coming out of this thing, we should be able to tell what it is. What its fruit is. Even though maybe it appears to be something good. It's got the horns of a lamb, but it speaks as a dragon. So that tells me right there that its its speech is going to give it a, give it away for us. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, the one with the seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns. It looked like a leopard. A leopard bear lion. <laughs> That's the first beast. This beast here exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Whose deadly wound was healed? So it has all seven heads now. One of the heads was hurt to the point where you'd think it was beyond repair but it was miraculously healed and so all the world those that are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life swear allegiance unto this thing but now this beast causeth encourages the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, we have to remember that this is what John is seeing. Now, if John was witnessing anything in our current world today, if he was witnessing technology, modern warfare, back then in the first century, he wouldn't hardly know how to describe it. And he would describe it with things that were familiar to him. So, 
when he says that this beast here does great wonders and maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men. This could be many things. This could be some type of uh, aerial warfare that he has that he has control of, that he has the authority over. It could be something supernatural. It could be something natural. It could be it could be lightning that he causes this to come down in the sight of everybody else. Your guess is as good as mine here. So we need to watch for something like that also. A lot of these things I really do not believe have happened yet. A lot of these things are probably sometime yet in the future. Maybe the not too distant future either. Of course, it could be hundreds of years off, but I don't believe so. Because the way things have been going in the earth now, if things continue on the path that they're going, I don't think that we'd make it that far. I think the Lord would have to do something lest there should be no flesh saved. As scripture says, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So he's within the sight of this conglomerate beast. So he's doing it with the authority and under the direction, maybe, of this world power. This is all conjecture, what I'm doing here. I'm just reading what it says, and I'm putting forth some of my ideas when I read it. A lot of these things, especially if they haven't been fulfilled yet, and I don't believe that they have. Uh, I think if they had been fulfilled, we could point to it and say, this was this being fulfilled. And now we can see it. Now that it's passed, we see it. And we have done that with many prophecies in the Bible. But these, I don't believe these have happened yet. But this person, now this person is generally called the false prophet. Okay? Scripture hasn't named him yet. Later on, it, it names this second beast with the horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. But he has a power to do these in the sight of the first beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. All right. This is probably not a statue. It, looking at it in the context of today's society, I think it's more like some type of... Uh, image on a screen, maybe a hologram, uh, a digital image, some type of thing that these a lot of people on the earth are going to be required to submit to this and to let this thing control their lives. And it's an image. An image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. The second beast had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. All right. Now, in time past, this was always looked at as this statue, an, an, an image, a statue that's caused to walk and speak, and that people are required to worship this thing. So in times past, people thought, a statue? And then, a little more recently, a robot, maybe? Now, in the computer age, this could be a hologram, or even more familiar, 
could be a website. It could be an app that you're required to download onto your phone. And there's an image there (laughs) that symbolizes this world system. And there could be a man there that's in control of it that's speaking to you. And people will be required to follow the directions of this. This seems more likely in today's world that it's something like that. Now, this is something that John's seen. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So it could be something like that. Something that you have to log on to and pledge your allegiance to or else. And if you don't do it, they're going to come and get you. That's what it sounds like. Verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. All right. (laughs) This is one of the most famous parts of Scripture. Um, He. I'm not real sure which he it's referring to there. Although they're working together, so I guess it doesn't matter whether it's referring to the first beast or the second beast. Now, this is generally called the Antichrist and the False Prophet, these two beasts here. But this first beast is more than likely a world system, a system of of government and world dominance that is ruled by a group of people, which is the ten horns and the ten crowns. And there's a spokesperson, this mouth that speaks out the blasphemies against God and things like that. And then there's the uh, the other bird beast that performs these wonders and requires people to worship this first beast, which is the system or whatever. This is just the way that I see it, okay? Could they be actually two men? Yeah. They could be. But I don't think so. If you look at the way this is all described, I think it's more a a world government that's a a group of people. It's a world system. All right? But this is going to envelop everybody. When it says that he causeth all, that means, the word causeth, it means that he requires or he wants it to be this way. Will everybody receive the mark? No, they do not. And we see that in the next chapter. Everybody will not receive this mark. Now, the word mark is the Greek word haragma, I believe is how that's pronounced. Haragma, which is C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. Now, this word haragma means a stamp, an imprinted mark, uh, a brand, uh, and it can even mean a scratch or etching. All right. Now it says that everybody is required to receive this mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So keep that in mind. It has to be right hand or forehead. Uh, there's been people discussing that maybe the uh, the thing, you know, I'm not going to say it because I don't want to strike on my channel. A lot of people have suggested that this that this thing, this inoculation or whatever it is, is the mark of the beast. I beg to differ. It couldn't be because it specifically says here that it's something that is received in the right hand or in the forehead. This is not received in the right hand, and it is not received in the forehead. 
So it is, is it okay to get this thing that's going around? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't get it, and I'm not going to. But it's something that's yet to come. Is it a computer chip? Well, I guess it could be. But only if it is a mark. It has to be some type of a mark or an etching or a brand or something like that. And it's something that would that would mark this person as being enrolled or a member of this system. Okay? And this is done, it says, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, it's some type of identifying mark, obviously. Uh, and I think that it's an identifying mark of some type of digital societal system. Which I believe is being prepared now. And this, this thing, when it comes, it will definitely be either in the right hand or in the forehead. Now, when it says the forehead, that could be eyes. It could be something with your eyes, maybe. I guess we'll find out, huh? Now, the last verse, verse 18, says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Now, of course, that's six, six, six. A lot of different ideas about that. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat them all here because there's so many different interpretations of what this could be. But there's something about his name and the number of his name. This system or man or whatever it is that maybe it adds up to 666 or I don't know there's a lot of different ideas there's different ideas about computer code that comes out to 666 it says that it's the number of a man uh, in numerology the number of mankind is usually understood to be 6 Whereas the number seven is the number of, of God, the divine perfection. So there's all kinds of different ideas here of what this could actually be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you today and I ask your blessing on all those that are listening here. And once again, I pray for understanding to open our, our hearts and our minds and our spirits to your word, that we might be able to understand it, that we might be able to see these things as they come upon the earth so that we will recognize them. And Lord, we, we believe that we will understand these things as they come to pass. We thank you for giving us understanding and for giving us discernment in these things. Lord, I ask blessings on all my friends, and I ask that, that they would be protected during this time, and we receive it, and thank you for it, in Jesus' name, the name that is above all names, amen. All righty. This has been a very long one today, and it's been difficult for me to film here. Uh, it has not rained yet. I felt a few sprinkle drops, a little bit. It's doing that right now. And uh, I brought an umbrella with me for my walk back just in case I need it. But I was interrupted. I was interrupted here about three or four different times with people walking through where I actually had to shut off the camera. So I love you all. And I'll see you the next time around. We'll be in Revelation chapter 14. 
拜。